Um, Amanda had a last minute conflict, so I am going to be presenting this. I am the co-PI for the study, um, but I will be relying, these are Amanda's slides she just sent me and um, some of her notes. So I will hopefully be able to do justice to um, the beautiful presentation that Amanda has put together on the implementation of physical activity for children and adolescents on treatment, our impact trial presenting the interve intervention and trial overview and really our progress, our update. Uh, before I begin, I just want to acknowledge, there we go, where we are. So Amanda is actually in BC, the picture that is nice and green in the grass and the mountains, um, but the work is being conducted here in Calgary where Amanda was with me during her um, postdoctoral work. And so we received CIHR funding um, as well as uh, funding from the Kids Cancer Care Foundation. Amanda has no disclosures um, to report and I will just acknowledge that I am the co-founder of Thrive Health, which provides educational training. You'll see a little bit later in the slides. Before we begin, we want to acknowledge all the work that has gone into this uh, project. You'll see updates later in the timeline, and it's been a long time in developing and coming, uh, but special thank you to the lab here, my health and wellness lab, and in particular, Emma McLaughlin, who's on the call today and is conducting her PhD research within um, part of the IMPACT program. All of the staff, the qualified exercise professionals and the volunteers, including undergrad students um, with Amanda at the University of the Fraser Valley. Really importantly, our key clinical champions at the two major children's hospitals in Alberta, um, Dr. Gilcher and Dr. Lewis at Alberta Children's Hospital and Dr. Wilson and Sarah Fisher at Stollery Children's Hospital in Edmonton. Um, as well, the peer program and the leadership of Dr. Carolina Chamorro-Vina. All of these programs, the support clinically, they're really all being pulled together to build the IMPACT program. And then as well, I want to acknowledge the funding. I mentioned CIHR and Kids Cancer Care Foundation um, for funding. Alberta Innovates has funded um, trainees on the projects for um, University of Calgary and the Traction CIHR program. So I'm going to provide um, an overview, um, including you know, what we did before even building and starting the trial, and then some of the details of the ongoing trial as well as a, a progress update. So you're joining on this call today because you know this already, um, and we're all well aware that physical activity is both safe, feasible, and beneficial for children and adolescents during treatment. There are numerous reviews and you just saw all of the work that had been presented by David, um, new studies coming out, many of which have been conducted by people that are on the call today that collectively suggest that physical activity during treatment can also decrease the intensity of symptoms and mitigate common short and long-term side effects. Um, we know that physical activity may also serve a protective function for things like bone mineral density, strength, mental health and improving immune system function. So a number of important critical um, benefits to treatment related side effects, mental quality of life um, and things that you know can end up snowballing and becoming bigger issues in the long term if they aren't addressed. However, we also know that children and adolescents experience a number of challenges that can really make it hard for them to engage in physical activity during treatment. For example, their symptoms and side effects, including deconditioning, cardiopulmonary dysfunction, can make it harder to engage in their physical activity. There are also psychosocial barriers, which can include things like anxiety, lowered self-esteem, changes in their bodies, um, and especially at critical ages, that can be a big factor, um, depression, fear of injury, and oftentimes um, it's the parents who are the gatekeepers that may also hold a number of these different um, fears. And they negatively impact children's willingness to even try exercise in the fir first place, or may make them more self-conscious or fearful when provided with the opportunity to, to try exercise. Their periods of isolation that many of them face with different treatments can also reduce their actual exercise opportunities. So real and perceived barriers that are challenges during treatments. Um, and at least in our experience, uh, you know, as researchers at the university, we've experienced many challenges in conducting research with patients. 
from variable treatment timelines that differ significantly child to child, ward restrictions. I mean, our wards here at the Children's Hospital really just opened up this last fall, uh, which really delayed our timeline for this trial. We did not have access as researchers to go into the hospital setting. It was closed to everything except for clinical care. Um, and then we've had waves of that as cold and flu season continues on. Um, so it's very challenging then in the in hospital setting to be able to um, offer physical activity on a consistent basis. Thus, when we reviewed about what we know about what had been done and patients' preferences for physical activity, um, what we can see is that there is this strong preference to have absolutely supervised physical activity, but that can be delivered close to or near um, or in their actual home. And for us here, many of the treatment protocols, children are in the hospital, but then they are sent back home um, as soon as possible. They're not kept in the hospital setting. We also spoke with 11 international experts as we thought about how we could develop something that would be more sustainable. Um, and these experts who have successfully offered in-hospital physical activity programs really stress the necessity to individualize the physical activity, to make it fun for the different age groups, and to partner and build critical relationships with those key healthcare partners, the champions, the other experts, um, so that you were delivering something that was going to be meaningful. We then spoke with the individuals in our environment. So 16 local healthcare providers who discussed more with us the, the potential barriers um, to offering physical activity within our settings here locally. Um, they really highlighted again the importance if we are going to be able to do this of making physical activity fun, making it accessible and being really flexible to patients treatment schedules. The other piece that they suggested was really to ensure that we can involve, if as needed, parents or siblings um, and really build that environment around the child to support their physical activity. A number of them suggested using um, alternative delivery methods such as video conference and Zoom um, to reach the children, especially given the changes in locales, their home, they're in, their home, they're in, so that there could be something offered on a regular basis. Based on all of this, um, we've developed impact, the implementation of physical activity for children and adolescents on treatments. And you're going to see uh, a few pictures of this participant in particular. So this is one of our participants that has gone through the trial to date. Um, IMPACT is a 12-week supervised, individualized physical activity intervention delivered by a trained and qualified exercise professional via video conference. It's currently being evaluated in a hybrid effectiveness implementation trial. So here, I'll tell you a bit more about all of these elements. So we're recruiting a number of different ways through the healthcare provider. So through ethics, we have a consent to contact form. And if the healthcare provider discusses this and the family is interested, we can collect that information and then reach out to the family. So we don't have to wait for them to reach out to us. We're also sharing this widely uh, via social media posts and through cancer support organizations such as Kids Cancer Care um, and sharing that information with the families and trying to reach them um, just through the, the general public. And then there is the potential for word of mouth, so snowball sampling and past participant referrals. The participants for IMPACT um, are children and adolescents between the ages of 5 to 18 years of age who have received a diagnosis of cancer or blood disease and are receiving treatment, scheduled to re receive treatment, or have completed treatment in um, less than three months from the start of the program. So of note, exclusion criteria are children who have fully completed treatment for longer than three months. Um, children who may be unable to participate in physical activity as assessed by their healthcare team or a physical activity specialist. Um, all of this work right now is being conducted in English, so they have to be able to um, speak and understand verbally English. Um, and the last exclusion criteria is um, a, a parent sorry, being unable or unwilling to be present at home because this is delivered vi via video conference. 
So depending on the age group and the needs of the participant, they either have to be just in the same home or they have to be able to be in the room with the child during the physical activity sessions in order to ensure safety. So after recruitment, individuals come in at baseline, um, a series of um, measures are done. So we collect personal medical information. We have self-report of physical activity levels, measure of physical functioning, and then a host of patient reported outcomes using scales appropriate to their ages um, based on the different PEDS scales. Then they receive the intervention, the impact intervention, and we're measuring attendance, fidelity, del delivery time and resources and safety as part of the implementation factors. And then again, to measure that effectiveness, we have a series of measures immediately post-intervention, the same measures. And then you can see shorter measures followed up um, at week 24 and at week 52. So we're really trying to take a good look at that long-term maintenance of physical activity and not just that specific behavior change that can happen with a well-designed and executed intervention. As part of the implementation work, we are conducting quality improvement cycles where data is reviewed, um, provided by healthcare providers and exercise interviews exercise professionals through interviews and the trial staff team meets on a very regular basis then to discuss the information that we're gathering and optimize our implementation strategies and delivery. So it really is the opportunity, unlike a traditional RCT, but to really look at how are we capturing, for example, our participants and what, what success are we having with our various outreach and recruitment strategies, and then to be able to tweak those, whether it's new posters up in the hallways that are better at catching attention, whether it is um, regularly attending healthcare professional rounds so that we're um, ensuring that the impact trial is kind of at the forefront of our healthcare providers as they engage with new patients. Um, we're optimizing then and modifying the implementation strategies throughout this so that there's um, um, the ability to really ensure that we don't change the intervention per se, the protocol for the 12 weeks doesn't change, but all of the strategy around implementation around it are integrated into, um, into this study. And then we're tracking and then being very transparent on reporting these quality improvement cycles so that we can see exactly when any changes are made and what impact those may have on those outcomes that we're measuring. In terms of the intervention itself, once the participants are enrolled and they complete the baseline assessments, they're assigned a qualified exercise professional who will they work with one-on-one, -on -one, two to three times a week for anywhere ranging from 15 to 45 minutes per session for the 12-week intervention. Sessions are always tailored to meet individual participant needs and preferences. So here you can see a picture, um, and this is Emma, who's on the call. She's one of the trainers in the program, working with her participant. Um, the caregiver is present, but you can see they're not on camera for this. So again, depending on the age and the needs of the child, um, the QEP is working and talking directly, hopefully, to them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, the participant in this case loves Frozen, a, pro, um, a popular children's movie. If anybody here has children <laughs> under the 10 or 12 age range, you know what we're talking about. And here they're seen practicing the balance like Elsa in her ice castle. So you'll see a bit more of this in our protocol documents um, here where you know, we have different themes that can be integrated, really tailored and individualized to the child. Um, and so I think I, yeah, no, right slide. Um, the QEPs are provided within their training, all of the physical activity protocol. So they see what is going to happen and where progression may happen um, each week. And so you can see here, it's a multimodal exercise program. There's um, functional movements, there's some cardiovascular types activity, balance, stretching. Um, and so it's really, you know, standardized in terms of where we're targeting the body, but then how it's delivered is really based on getting to know that individual child. So here's an example of an animal theme with all the suggestions um, for what the actual activities can be. And in this case, they're all named after different animals. And then there is a separate document detailing, okay, what is the elephant trunk? Um, what is a butterfly movement? And so the QEP can call it the names of those and then engage in the different activities from silly monkey to drinking birds to alligator crawls and crab walks. 
So to do this, a huge component of successful implementation of impact has been standardizing our exercise professional training. So if you were here at the PIOC last year, Amanda talked about the training that covers then our knowledge about pediatric oncology. So kind of what we had at, at that point in time. Um, and that includes talk, understanding the diseases, their treatments and the side effect phase so that individuals QEPs who are trained have the skills then to tailor the physical activity and exercise based on these factors. Um, other side effects the child may be um, um, experiencing and other factors like age so that we can really ensure safe delivery of the physical activity. We also want the QEP to be equipped with the knowledge about the role of physical activity for this population and give them the skills to be able to progress physical activity ultimately to ensure they can deliver an effective program, one that's gonna provide those physical and psychosocial benefits. Finally, we know it's imperative that our qualified exercise professionals be able to understand the preferences this population has for physical activity and many of the barriers they may be experiencing, physical, psychosocial, or otherwise. Um, and so we um, integrate key behavior change skills in the training of our exercise professionals so that they can translate that to what the individual needs and create an autonomy supportive environment, one that we call fostering a positive motivational climate that promotes physical activity behavior changed within our evidence based physical activity intervention. So we've developed um, a very comprehensive training and you're gonna see a bit more of this in my talk next, but it starts with our online training modules through Thrive Health that all of our QEPs have to take. So any of the QEPs that come into impact, um, they have to completed, have completed an undergrad degree and have one year of volunteering with an, our adult program and completed our online Thrive Health cancer and exercise training as part of that. We also have a pediatric training that was um, designed by Dr. Amanda Wirtz and Sarah Grimshaw that is online, so they complete that. QEPs then enroll in a webinar that has been developed by the collaborators of, of our impact study, so Dr. Greg Gulcher, Dr. Chamorro Vina, Sarah Fisher, and myself and Amanda. And then there's a scenario-based competency training session that really goes through um, how they would implement and teach those behavior change. They can practice technical issues that they might come across within the Zoom thing, um, how to deal with family members. You know, if it's got the sibling there, how are we still focusing and making it safe for the child with cancer or a participant, but also addressing the needs and integrating um, the sibling into that. Finally, they start shadowing. So before they actually have a one-on-one -on -one, um, that they're leading, they shadow an existing group-based remote physical activity program that's delivered in the community by Dr. Carolina Chamorovina, the peer program. And then they start practicing delivery um, using some healthy um, child models that we have through contacts that are in that same five to around 12 year age range. So a number of pieces they go through from educational to hands-on learning to working with healthy children before they're ever fully trained and are taking on a participant in this actual program. So where we are now with IMPACT, um, we had ethics in 2021 and it took a long time because of COVID and changes in our healthcare system to get institutional approvals. At this point in time, we have seven trial staff who are fully trained um, and we opened recruitment um, in 2022 at both of our children's hospitals here in Alberta. We've had 25 consent to contacts, one um, participant who reached out via advertising and no word of mouth to this point in terms of our recruitment. Um, we've screened 26, you can see here, some were ineligible, some declined, um, some we could not reach. So we've had six consented and enrolled. To date, we have completed um, five for baseline, five have completed um, right through to the 12-week assessment period. Um, of the five children, most of them are meeting three times a week, three of them. One has met two times a week, which works best with their schedule because they had other sporting activities. And one was re meeting one or twice a week. And it's really been um, medical or family issues that have kept them from having a regular schedule in any case. So reasons for skipping um, medical appointments or they've had school or other commitments to go to. 
The actual sessions have ranged. Um, most three out of the five children had the typically full 45 minute sessions, but the two other participants to date have had sessions that ranged anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes. And so we're tracking all of these implementation factors so that we can actually report the dose, what is actually being received um, by these children. Here you can see the nature of our participants. So we range from five to 14 years of age, both males and females and a variety of cancer types. Um, and in terms of some of the implementation factors we're measuring, um, we're tracking all costs to see sustainably what will it take for this program to be sustainably delivered over time. So you can see the costs of uh, and the hours for our qualified exercise professionals, our study staff team who conduct the assessments and the coordination of the actual um, trial, which is funded right now all of these costs through the grants that we have received. We are also um, conducting these quality improvement cycles, as was mentioned, currently speaking with three local healthcare providers to um, refine implementation strategies. And right now they're suggesting that that consent to contact procedure is working well and they've had minimal feedback other than positive things that they've heard from their patients coming back to them. Um, we've refined and made it easier for tracking documents for our exercise professionals and really making sure that what they're tracking each session is going to be stuff that we're able to easily report at the end of the trial. And then we're capturing and offering ongoing training and in-service support for our trial staff and in particular for the exercise professionals who are delivering. So we've had expertise come in and do specific sessions on exercise modifications, for example. So that's where the trial is currently at. We're excited to see over the next year how many children we can come into this and ultimately what is going to be implemented that can ensure the safety and deliver a really effective program that can address some of those barriers that we see to offering regular physical activity for children who are on treatment. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. Hopefully I'm on time, close to on time, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much.